Well, hey everybody, welcome to In The Growth Space. David here, I'm really, really excited about this conversation. And I'm really excited because this particular episode is one that you're gonna really wanna watch on YouTube. Um, so if you're listening to the podcast on a traditional podcast platform, I would encourage you to go over to our YouTube channel and watch this one there because we are in studio. I'm in a studio with my guest, Tim Tannert, and um, what an amazing studio. I just have to say, first and foremost, thank you to Baratang Advisors. Um, Greg Fuhrer allowed us to use his amazing studio. Just fabulous. You've got to see this studio. So uh, I'd invite you to go over to YouTube, uh, check out the video there. And while you're there, why don't you hit subscribe and then also um, hit the, the the little bell so that you're notified when uh, we upload videos to, to the channel. So today's episode, as I said, is with uh, a, a good friend, Tim Tanner. And uh, let me just tell you a little bit about Tim to start with. Um, Tim embarked on his career as a pharmacist. Um, early on, he discovered his true calling. And that true calling was, in, was assisting the teams and companies that he served to flourish. And although he was passionate about aiding patients' health, he realized that his ability to positively impact more lives was through enhancing the health of the organizations that he worked with. So this revelation led Tim into a more than 20 year journey into executive leadership. He has assumed the roles as both COO and CEO for a variety of companies. In 2011, the opportunity arose for Tim to become the CEO of a small pharmacy software firm. And that's where his role was to propel growth and scalability. Over the ensuing decade, he played an instrumental role in transforming the company from a lesser known entity to an uncontested market leader. And the, the company's workforce just burgeoned from 20 to over 150 employees, and it changed hands twice before he eventually took the reins as president and CEO within a division of a Fortune 500 corporation. So Tim successfully established a robust leadership team that could thrive autonomously, paving the way for his next challenge, aiding other enterprises in achieving similar triumphs. In 2021, Tim established Culture Cures with the aim of guiding companies across diverse industries and cultivating exceptional teams and cultures. I know that you're going to really love this conversation and whether, whether you're a CEO, whether you're a business founder, whether you're an emerging leader or an advancing leader, Take a look at and listen to this conversation through the lens of your particular role. And as, as, as Tim shares his acronym of Culture Cures, um, you're going to really understand a, a methodology and a framework that even you can use no matter where you are in an organization and also for your personal life. So let's go ahead and get into this conversation with Tim Tanner in studio. Well, hey, everybody, welcome to In the Growth Space. Um, if you're watching on our YouTube channel, um, you can re readily recognize that we are not over Zoom today. We are actually in studio and I have a great guest with me today. I'm so excited to be able to share with you my good friend, Tim Tanner. Tim, welcome to the podcast. Welcome. Thank you, David. Pleasure to be here. Oh man, it's so exciting and, and I'm really excited for this conversation. And um, I think just to get started, let's, you know, we're going to talk a lot about culture, but before we do that, Talk about your history as a CEO and, and why was culture so important to you? Yeah, absolutely. So I have an interesting background. I actually started my career as a pharmacist of all things. And I tell people while I was always passionate about making my patients healthy, I quickly discovered my true passion, my true calling was to make the teams and companies healthy that I worked in. And that's what uh -huh. really set me uh, on a 20 plus year career of executive leadership, CEO, COO of multiple companies. And mm. when I first got out of pharmacy school, 
I learned how to be a great pharmacist. Mm -hmm. I never learned how to be a great manager or leader. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I've got some funny stories of absolute and total disasters right <laughs> out of pharmacy school. Um, as you kind of uh, try to feel your way into this new, um, new area. Mm -hmm. And as Marshall Goldsmith says, what got you here won't get you there. Right. You've got to evolve. You've got to grow yeah. in your leadership journey. And so now hindsight being 2020, being able to look back in 20 plus year career, I fully understand that leaders aren't born. Yeah. They're developed and right. it's a ongoing journey towards mastery. Mm. And yeah. so trying to boil, what does that journey look like? What are the critical elements of that journey to help people um, be able to build great teams. One mm. of my favorite sports quotes from Tom Izzo, and he says, the, the best players don't win games, the best teams do. Yeah, and so sad. as leaders, building the best teams, getting the most out of our teams is ultimately what it's all about. Mm -hmm. And so helping people develop a roadmap yeah. to make that happen has become an absolute passion of mine. Oh, I love that. I love that. So talk a little bit about your some of your own leadership growth journey, if you don't mind, because one of the things I know is that um, leaders, in order to grow, they've got to get out of their comfort zone. We talk about this all the time, getting outside of our comfort zone. And, you know, that that feeling of when you get outside of your comfort zone and you're doing something that you've never done before, maybe t talk a little bit about how does how does that feel what is that like? And then how does your, your, your comfort zone maybe just expand a little bit? Yeah, you know, honestly, it's probably the scariest thing that anyone does. Right. And I think that for whatever reason, society tends to have this vision of a CEO as a perfect entity, <laughs> right? Someone that, that has all the answers and knows exactly what to do and never makes mistakes and is always inspiring. And it's, that's just could not be more false. Mm. And, you know, if you look through our history of the great leaders of our country, <laughs> uh, of our society, every single one of them had their strengths and they had their weaknesses. Yeah. And so there is no perfect person. And so I think step one is just coming to that realization. Like, yeah. you know, I, I am a flawed human. <laughs> right. Um, and yeah. I'm going to uh, make mistakes along the way. Mm -hmm. And as leaders, we can't be afraid to make mistakes. We've yeah, got to so uh, just keep moving the ball forward. And mm -hmm. so from my perspective, that's where it all starts. Mm -hmm. And then um, one of our family core values is you become who you hang around. Yeah. And so I believe creating that circle around you is the absolute most important thing that leaders can do. Leaders yeah. have to have a peer group. They have to have a cohort. They have to have sounding boards to be yeah. able to help them think through the things that they're battling because often that's the loneliest position in the company. Yeah. And so that would be another real, I think, start to that journey mm -hmm. and starting your learning process is just surround yourself with pe great people. Yeah. And then there's so many great tools out there now. And so it's that focus. In business school, we learn how to read a PNL. We yeah. learn how to uh, develop a marketing strategy. We learn how to do all of these things that are critically important to running a business. Yeah. Uh, we don't learn how to lo lead, grow, and develop yeah, team members. True. And so that's where the, the focus really needs to be. You know, you said something a, a moment ago, that I think is so, it's so impactful. And, and I think that especially I, if, if our, if you're a listener and you're an emerging leader, I think you need to pay attention to, to what Tim just said. You got to recognize that you're not perfect. We're not perfect. And the other thing is, is that when you get outside of your comfort zone, you're going to be doing things that you've never done before. I mean, if you think about like your driving, when you first learned to drive, you had to think about everything. You had to put the car in park. And even before you did that, you had to adjust your mirrors. And, and so you're not going to do things perfectly that first time. And you have to think about things all the time. So 
by virtue of just getting outside of your comfort zone, you're going to make mistakes, right? And Absolutely. so you have to recognize that that's okay. And, and it's okay because if you use it as a learning experience, it's, that's, that's what's going to set you up for the, your, your next success. I, I'm wondering, is, is there any um, learning experience that you've had in your career? I'm sure over many of them, right? But is there, any, is, there, is there any one that sticks out, especially maybe as it relates to your company culture? Because yeah. I think that there's a lot of CEOs who, who they, they know that a, a culture, a strong culture, is their key to high performance and yet they don't know how to do it. They don't Absolutely. know how, they don't have the tools to be able to do it. So maybe, maybe talk a little bit about that. Yeah, there's a great Deloitte study, you know, Deloitte's a, a top tier consulting firm yeah. and um, their studies are, are normally pretty spot on. These yeah. things aren't just uh, people's ideas or thoughts. These are real numbers. And what Deloitte found was that 90% of CEOs either agree or strongly agree that culture is very important to their organizations. And yeah. so you might say, well, no duh, right? Yeah, right <laughs> of course right. it is. But here's the surprising thing that that study found is less than 12% of CEOs said that they even understood the culture within their own organization. Mm. Mm. And then only 46% of those CEOs said that they felt equipped to tackle the culture challenges within mm. their organization. So again, these are not things that most schools are tackling. These are not right. things that, um, that we know how to do. And, and one of my favorite other quotes is <laughs> by a guy by the name of Doug Campbell. And, and he said when he became a CEO. He thought that culture was one one of many tools in the tool bag with, mm. you know, efficient operations and strong financials. And what he said is what he discovered quickly is culture isn't one aspect of the game. It is the game. Mm, that's interesting. And so you have to first win in the workplace before you can win in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And so what does that entail? And so being very... Uh, conscious about the culture that you're driving it it needs to start from top bottom mm -hmm. but great cultures aren't top to bottom driven they are driven from within mm -hmm. so to build an environment where people are comfortable holding each other accountable um it's challenging each other demanding that we are doing the best that we can fully acknowledging we're going to screw up, we're going to make mistakes, but putting in the effort mm -hmm. um, and constantly driving the ball forward, those self-propelling cultures are ultimately the cultures that um, get results. Right. And the other thing just to kind of add is that often when I talk to, about culture to CEOs, there's this impression that culture is this soft <laughs> fluffy, yeah. feel good, making people happy, happy right? Um, <laughs> free snacks in the break room type of thing. And that's not at all what we're talking about. And so what we found in a McKinsey study, another mm. top tier study, is that top quartile cultures show 147% year over year earnings improvement against their cohort. Wow. Their 10-year growth tends to be 516% higher wow. than the peers in their core heart, cohort. Their employee retention is 30% greater. That's huge. It's huge. That's huge. One of the number one challenges that CEOs say to me is, how do I attract, keep, and ret retain yeah. great talent? Mm -hmm. This is how you do it. Mm -hmm. and, the other aspect is innovation within these organizations is actually 30% higher than their peer group as, wow. as well because you're providing an environment where people can think out of the box. They yeah. can challenge the status quo. They can bring their full selves to work, right. which also is their creativity. Yeah. I'm so glad you said something about creativity here, um, Tim, because, you know, one of the things that... Um, 
when I think about a great and a high performing culture, I think of allowing your people and, and fostering an environment where your people can be creative and come up with creative solutions that that's that is innovative. Maybe industry innovation um, occurs because of having the safe environment where people can try things. I, yes. I know one of my clients um, in the pandemic, the early days of the pandemic, they had a team of their leaders who actually came up with an idea. It was a brilliant idea that quite frankly, you know, kept them, they, they hit their budget and they hit their targets because of an innovative idea, yeah. because they had an environment where they could try things. Yeah. They didn't know if it was going to work or not. But I, I love the fact that you, you talk about that creativity because I think that that's an element of a high performing culture and a high performing company. Absolutely, 100%. And getting back to the concept of CEOs feel that they need to have the answers, yeah. this is a perfect example of how that is a complete fallacy. Yes. Right? We want our team to have the answers. Right. If we as leaders don't have people within our team that can do their jobs better than we can do it, yeah. then we've completely and totally let the organization down. Yeah, right on. And, you know, and it's so interesting because I, I think about when we hire people, we hire them because of their their talent, their wisdom, their abilities, yet so oftentimes we keep them in a box. And so what you're saying, though, is these high-performing organizations allow people to, to flourish and really yeah. unlock the potential and unlock the wisdom within that, that organization, within that team. Absolutely. And so... It starts with clarity. Yes. And so uh, I've developed a model to help people think of how do we build a high performing team and culture within our that. organization. It's called the Cures model, C U R E S. Mm. And the first, the C is clarity. Yeah. And I like to say that it's the role of the leader to be able to fully explain. Um, what we're going to do and why we're going to do it, mm -hmm. but they need to allow the team to come up with the how. Yeah. Right. And I think the magic, the creativity, the tapping into the talents of your team is really allowing them to have the guardrails of this is what we are going to accomplish. This is why it's important, yeah. but then let them figure out the how. And it's yeah. such a um, critical step, I think, for leaders to really think about is, am I driving the how yeah. or am I stepping back and letting them right. take control of the how? And ultimately, if your team owns the how, they're going to own the results. Mm -hmm. They're going to own the process yeah. because it was their idea. It's their baby, so to speak. Yeah, so true. So C is clarity. So talk, talk about the U. What is the... So the U is upgrowth. Okay. And so great teams great cultures develop their people. Mm -hmm. And so being able to provide an environment where the team members feel free to uh, make mistakes, to feel free to learn. And mm -hmm. one of the great concepts that I've seen work extremely well is this concept of 70, 30, excuse me, 70, 20, 10. Okay. And 70-20-10 is when you look at the core job description of your team, 70% mm -hmm. of their time should be focused on just execution on their core job description. 20% mm -hmm. of your team's time should be focused on growth activities that are projects, uh, you know, tasks to do that push them outside of their comfort zone okay. that allow them to learn, explore, push their abilities, but are directed by the direct manager. Mm -hmm. So the direct manager cons consciously thinking of what can I give this person to keep yeah. moving them forward to allow them to grow and experience new things that are slightly outside those core job responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And then the 10% is allowing that individual team member hmm. to come up with what they would like to do, what they would like to learn. And as long as that can directly apply to the business and the role and is yeah. applicable, to giving, giving them the space and the freedom and the creativity to be able to do that. 
And so I think of the 70-20-10 model as this model to help people really think about their team. Mm -hmm. And what am I having my team doing? And yeah. is it contributing to the growth? Right. Because the reality is that if your people aren't growing, if they are great people, if they're the right people in the right seats, if they want to be high performers, high achievers, if they're not growing with you, they're going to find a place to grow. Yeah, that's true. And so this becomes critical to that employee retention that we talked about. You know, that even just leads into the the, the idea and the, the, the comment that I, the, the statement that I always make, and that is that if your people aren't growing, your company isn't going to grow either. And so, and, and conversely, if your comp if your people are growing, then your company is going to grow. And and I think your your seventy twenty ten um, rule is so it, it's you know I, I think of I, I think it's Google that that allows their people to use like twenty percent of their time or something like that mm -hmm. um, to be able to do creative endeavors mm -hmm. that might lead to new tools, new, new technology. And I think even Gmail was a part of that. Like yeah. that, that was one of the things that came out of that 20%. Absolutely. And the way I use that 10% when I use this model as CEO is I would then create launch and learns mm. where the yeah. people that use their 10% to yeah. do something cool or creative or learn something new had to share it with the rest of the team. Love that. So yeah. again, this becomes a self-propelling mm -hmm. model within the organization where people are low, learning, growing, and bringing that back and teaching others. Yeah. And so it, it becomes a flywheel. Mm, I love that. I love that. Okay, so we've gone through the C, we've gone through the U. What's the uh, R? R is relationships. Uh. And built into the core of who we are from a biological, neurological standpoint is humans have to have a sense of belonging. Yes, yes. And I use the analogy a lot. If you've ever been to a theme park or um, a sports stadium and there are hundreds, tens of thousands of people around you, and you're kind of just walking, not really paying attention, getting to your seats, getting to wherever you're going. And all of a sudden, out of a sea of people, you recognize someone mm. that you know. Mm -hmm. Have you ever thought, like, why is that? Right. And the reality is we are hardwired as humans to be able to identify safety, mm -hmm. to oh, yeah. identify our tribe, mm -hmm. the people that are one of us yeah. and great cultures are able to cultivate that within their organizations. Mm -hmm. Now, I firmly believe that the word isn't family. Mm, yeah. uh, we don't pick our family. Right. <laughs> uh, and often most people have a hard time holding their family accountable. Sure. Uh, but we are a high performing team. Mm. And so as part of that is we've got to um, be able to build those relationships. And, mm -hmm. you know, Patrick Lincioni's five dysfunctions of team, right? Yeah. It all starts with trust, trust yeah. but ultimately it gets to results. Yeah. And it's through those bonds. It's through those uh, abilities to have difficult conversations. Yeah. And you can have difficult conversations with someone much more easily mm -hmm. if they know that you care about them. So true. Yeah, so true. You know, I use the analogy all the time with my kids. You know, there are times that I have to tell my kids, you know, you need to brush your teeth, your, yeah. your breath stinks, right? Or <laughs> right. something that they probably don't want to hear. Right. But they accept that because they know I'm not telling them this to make them feel bad. I'm not telling them this to put myself above them. I'm telling this to them because I love them. You care. I care about them. And I want them to be the best versions of themselves. Right. You know, there's a very hard line between being nice and being kind. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of leaders get stuck in trying to be nice. Mm -hmm. Nice is ignoring a problem that exists because you want to uh, keep the peace. Right. Kind is being able to have those conversations mm -hmm. because we 
truly love and care about each other and we want the best for each other we want the yeah. best for the organization then that all starts with relationships mm. yeah. and so um being able to um have open honest conversations being able to create a healthy environment where people um have things in common not just within work right yeah, sure. having those types of activities and events driving those relationships within the organization mm -hmm. is really truly critically important for success well and i think that when you have a relationship with someone and and that relationship has been fostered you you can it's, it's easier to be kind because you you do care and, it, you know, I, I, I talk about having a speak straight conversation and it's, it's, it's that kind of a conversation really is about moving a situation forward and, and bringing some some resolution to to a, a situation. And it, it's so much easier to have a, uh, a speak straight conversation when I have a relationship with somebody and yeah. when I care about somebody. So so being able to speak straight is is a caring kind thing to do as opposed to just being nice and ignoring what's what's going on underneath the surface and quite frankly high performance requires us to speak straight absolutely absolutely so those of uh my my friends my clients people that know me well know that my daughter wants to be a professional soccer player yep uh that is her goal and she uh, set this goal at seven years old. She's now 13 and she executes every single day against that it's vision. Amazing. But one of the cool things this past summer is I took her to the University of North Carolina hmm. to experience one of their camps. And so she could train with the coaches. And for those of you out there that uh, don't know much about the University of North Carolina women's soccer program, the first 20 years of NCAA women's soccer, UNC won the national championship 16 of those 20 years. Wow. The four years they didn't win it, three of those years they were runners up, in the fourth year they were semifinalists. And so when you think through sports, it's hard to find a culture yeah. in an organization that has been more dominant. Mm -hmm. And often when we talk about high performing teams and cultures, we like to go to sports because it's quite easy to look and say who won, who lost. Right. There's a very clear definition of winning. Mm -hmm. And so I was excited just to have my daughter experience this environment. That environment, yeah, sure. Well, as a culture coach, <laughs> I was like a kid in the candy store hanging around those coaches and sure. that that program. And so the entire history of the UNC women's soccer program, they've only had one head coach. Wow. His name's Anson Dorrance. Mm. Anson has won 22 national championships. Wow, that's incredible. It's incredible. Yeah. What he's been able to accomplish in that program. And, you know, quick aside, Everyone talks in the United States uh, of, around women's soccer with the U.S. national team. Mm -hmm. Well, the very first U.S. women's national team that won the World Cup, mm -hmm. Anson Dorrance was the head coach. Wow. Okay. And what most people don't realize is more than 50% of the roster of that team was from UNC. UNC. Uh, interesting. Right? Yeah. So... Great, great, great program. Yeah. And so we step on campus, my daughter's trading with the coaches and Anson comes over to talk to the parents. The very first thing he talked about was culture. Culture. Mm, the yeah. very first thing. Here's the winningest coach in probably NCAA sports history. Yeah. He's in every Hall of Fame there is for, for soccer. Yeah. And the very first thing he talked about was core values. And he said, if your daughter is the best player in the world, I don't care. She's only going to make my squad if she picks up cones after training. That's what it takes. <sighs> yeah, that's so right? good. And so, so that was kind of cool. And then yeah. the goalkeeper coach, my daughter's a goalkeeper. The goalkeeper coach comes over. Uh, he goes by Big Bird, really tall guy, <laughs> great guy. Cool. And he talks about 
some of the things that they do at UNC with the goalkeepers. And one of the things they talk about is perfection training. So mm. the coach will stand on the top of the penalty mark at where they take penalty kicks and kick hard balls at the goalkeepers in what they call their bubble, the area that they should make 100% of the saves. But at UNC, the standard is not to make the save. The standard is 100% perfectly clean catch this mm. ball. Wow. And so if they catch the ball, they bobble it, it's not good enough. They get in the back of the line, the next goalkeeper goes in, and they count how many perfect reps that the, the team can do. Wow. And so that was pretty cool because part of a high-performing culture is to set high expectations. High standards, yeah. High standards, sure. right? Yeah, yeah. And so if the conversation just stopped there, I was all in. I thought, right, well, yeah, yeah. this is amazing. Yeah. But what was even more amazing is Big Bird keeps talking and he says, you know what, funny thing happened. A couple years ago, I had to have surgery. And I was going to be out for like 12, 16 weeks. Hmm. One week into my recovery, I get a phone call with all of the goalkeepers on the team calling me on speakerphone. Okay. It's like, what could go wrong in one week? He yeah. brought in a coach to fill in for him, one of the best coaches in the country. Yeah. And the goalkeeper said, coach, we've got a problem. We need you to help us fix. He's like, what's going on? Yeah. And they said, you know, that coach that you brought in, uh, you need to talk to him because he's not holding us to our standard. We bobble the ball. He says, good save. Oh. It wasn't a good save. We bobbled the ball. We should be out. <laughs> coach, Amazing. don't let him reduce our standard. And so That's the so point great. of this entire story is this. Great cultures focus on culture, mm -hmm. right? They set high standards, mm -hmm. and the team propels it. Holds each other accountable. And they right? hold each other yeah. accountable, and so they good. become very protective of those standards mm -hmm. because yeah. those standards, they know drive results, and yeah. they don't want anyone to lower them. Yeah, And that's how you know you've really hit the nail on the head. Well, you know, something out of that story, too, that just it, it hit me as you were sharing it is that the coach in, in business, it's the CEO, right? It's the leader, has to talk about culture, has to talk about it, teach it, train it every single day. Absolutely. And I, I've, I've told a, a couple of clients of mine, like, you're going to think that you are the chief repetition officer yes. when you come when it comes to culture, because you're going to say things over and over and over again. So just get used to that. Be yeah. the chief repeti repetition officer. So my daughter is in the soccer. My son is in the Boy Scouts. Love it. And I'm an assistant scoutmaster with his troop. And in Boy Scouts, the core values are the scout law. Ah, uh, yeah, right. Every single meeting, every single Boy Scout <laughs> repeats word for word the scout law. Yeah. Yeah. That, right. And so that repetition, that um, routine, mm -hmm. that cadence yeah. of constantly reinforcing the culture, the fact that these coaches, the very first thing they said to the parents was culture, mm. knows it, you know, just reinforces it's the, at the top of mind. Right. Right. Well, and I think that if, if there's a way that organizations can create a cadence, a, a way to be able to work that into their every day, I know a lot of clients uh, of mine will start their meeting by talking about either their values, their, their, their culture behaviors, a behavior of the week. Yes. Those kinds of repetitions, those kinds of cadences help you and facilitate facilitate those kinds of conversations to bring them top of mind all the time. Hundred percent. Yeah. Hundred percent. So I know we've 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 covered the C, the U, the R. We just talked about relationships. What's yep. the E? Let's go. So the that. conversation we had takes us right into the E, which is expectations. Love it. Great yeah. cultures are crystal clear on expectations. Mm -hmm. Expectations of behaviors. Yeah. That's your core values. Mm -hmm. Expectations of roles, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. What do you own? Yeah. Creating those clear swim lanes across the organization. Expectations of numbers. Mm. What's the number yeah. that you need to hit? Every person in the organization should have at least one number that they're responsible for. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and so great culture set high bars, high standards, and the team uh, embraces them and challenges themselves and holds each other accountable to make it happen. Love that. Yeah, I love that. So setting the high bar and, 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 and the standards high, um, creating those expectations that people are going to uh, reach towards and, 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 and hit and, yes. and hold each other accountable to. So that's the E. What's the S then? Let's come back. So the S is systems. Okay. Yeah. And I firmly believe that every business has to run on an operating system. Yeah, for sure. And there's a lot of them out there. I'm biased. <laughs> I, I have a strong opinion of which one I believe is the best. But the reality is I don't care which one you pick. Mm -hmm. You have to pick one. And you cannot reinvent the wheel. And here's why. If you try to create your own operating system, mm -hmm. there's no clear right or wrong way of doing it. And so it creates ambiguity first. Yeah. Yeah. And it reduces accountability because it's too easy to slide. Sure. Yeah. Right? Well, you know, we're supposed to meet every week, but we're not going to meet this week. <laughs> or we're supposed to set priorities for every person, but these people aren't going to have priorities. Or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And so being able to have a solid, repeatable operating system that's been used in tens of thousands of companies across the globe mm -hmm. sets you up for success. Because again, culture isn't just the HR aspect. Right. It's not just the way we feel or employee satisfaction. Mm -hmm. It's how do we run our business? Right. And everything is really seen through the lines or the lens, excuse me, of culture. Yeah. It's how we do things. It's how we approach it. It's how we execute. It's the uh, it's how we we interact as a team. It's how we hold each other accountable. And so, a solid operating system is key to success. You know, I think that's true with every organization. If you have a system that you're following, whether it's a lean system, you know, for manufacturing, whatever, if you follow that. It kind of goes back to the E, right? If it, we, we've got to yes. have our expectations, and so we got to hold each other accountable. And, right. and and if we have a system, you're darn sure that we're gonna we're gonna meet because right. we all expect it. We were talking before we uh, started uh, recording about um, just accountability and how important it is to have an accountability partner. I was telling you how much. Uh, my accountability partner when I was uh, in the triathlon um, helped because I knew that at 2.38 in the afternoon, I better have my butt in the gym because if I didn't, I was going to catch a lot of crap for that. <laughs> <laughs> and and you were talking about your accountability partner, your group. Yeah, um, and, my and so running that, group. Yeah, that accountability to the system, I think, is really a, a key element. So those I, I could see how that E and the S, the expectations and having a high standard – along with the system, just go hand in hand to create that high performance. Yeah, so the illustration I like to use is a bunch of gears. Yeah, sure. And each of the C-U-R-E-S are all gears that are all intertwined. Mm. And if one stops moving, they, they all stop. Yeah. They all have to work. Because it's, the same can be said with clarity. A great system helps with clarity. Where are we going? How are we going to get there? Why mm -hmm. is it important, right? right? It helps with developing your people. How yeah. can we do the 70, 20, 10? How can we push them? Mm -hmm. What are the priorities that we were working on? Right. It, the, and then who could be doing those priorities? So it yeah. ties into that. It ties into relationships. How do we build a great mm -hmm. culture? How do we have straightforward conversations? How do we work our way up the Lincioni Trust Pyramid? Right. Um, it, you know, expectations, expectations, roles, numbers, priorities, mm. and then the system. So all of these things are, are intertwined. Yeah, right. You cannot just take one of them and say, okay, I'm going to fix this. Right. <laughs> it doesn't right. work that way, yeah. right? It has to be holistic. Mm. And getting back to the fact that less than 46% you know, of employee or CEOs know how to fix their culture problem, I think that's why. Right, right. And so there there is a lot to it. Mm-hmm. But the reality is the more you can break it down into bite-sized chunks right. 
and make consistent progress along all of these areas, mm-hmm. um, you can't help but build a better company. Right. And so that's really what I help my clients do Love is to, to zoom out yep. and to get out of the weeds mm-hmm. and to say, okay, what can we do this quarter? Yeah. What are the key steps? How do we break this into bite-sized chunks? Because mm-hmm. quite honestly, you also have a business to run. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> they, Absolutely. They have to execute in the business yes. while they're working on the business. So you kind yeah. of get the sense that you're building the airplane in mid-flight. Right. And I get it. That That's a real-world challenge. Mm-hmm. But having a coach yep. that can be that sounding board, that can be that accountability partner right. to help you think through these things, mm-hmm. to work with the leadership team, to get everyone moving in one direction mm-hmm. is critical to helping organizations truly drive the culture in their their company. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention um, the fact that, um, Tim, you and I are going to actually collaborate and, and do some workshops here coming up uh, in the spring here as, as we're recording this. And so i um, really excited about that because I think there are a lot of uh, leaders who just don't know how to do this. Like, how do we actually roll up our sleeves and and, and do this? And, and we're going to share how to do that um, with them. So uh, be, you know, be listening. Uh, make sure that you uh, subscribe to the channel uh, because we're going to share with you um, uh, more about that in the in the coming weeks. And I, I'm really excited about that because yeah, I think it'll be really a lot of fun. Absolutely. There's such power in getting diverse companies and organizations together, absolutely. helping them think through these things, breaking it down into bite-sized chunks, yeah. coming up with an actionable game plan of this is what we're going to focus on in the weeks to come and to drive results there um, will help them move forward. And it's going to be a lot of fun working with you on that and and making that happen and and bringing true value to these companies. Yeah, exactly. So we've talked about culture cures, C-U-R-E-S. Why don't you just recap what each each of those letters are real quick so that we kind of just read. So clarity getting the team fully aligned with where you're going, how you're going to get there, why it's important. The youth upgrowth, being able to fully develop and challenge your team, Mm -hmm. to be able to grow them um, as your organization grows. The R is relationships, being able to build those bonds, build that trust so you can have honest, open, deep conversations Um, that truly drive the organization forward. E is expectations, the clarity of expectations around the numbers, the priorities, the the roles and responsibilities of each person. And then the S, the systems, to have a proven operating system to run your business. Don't recreate the wheel. Mm. Just take a system and execute on it. It's going to pay dividends. I love that, Tim. I, I think that you know any organization um, would be very well to do to tap into Tim's wisdom, not only you know as a culture expert, but also as a former CEO. Uh, he's he's run you know businesses. He has run cultures, and he's followed systems uh, in in that as well. And so I definitely want to make sure that um, if you're listening to this, and this has really sparked an interest reach out to Tim. Tim, how, how can they get in touch with you? How can our listeners get in touch with you? Yeah, absolutely. So you can go to culturecures.com. So the branding behind us, that's that's my site. <laughs> uh, you can also reach me at tim at culturecures.com. Love it. Love it. Tim, any last words, anything that we haven't covered today that you want to just share with the audience? Um, any last words? Yeah, I think Going back to the the concept that this is a journey to mastery. Yeah. One of my other favorite quotes is, you don't sing a song to get to the end. <laughs> you sing the song because of the enjoyment of the song itself. Yeah. But <laughs> for some reason, we as humans, we're all wired to just try to get to the end. We want to get to that 
that success <laughs> destination. Mm. And I think the hardest lesson I had to learn as a leader is there is no success destination. Yeah, it's, it's all a journey, man. right? It's all a journey. Yeah. And when I think back over my career, one of my biggest regrets is I didn't enjoy the journey as much as I should have. Totally. And, you know, I had great success facilitating the growth of a small company through multiple sale transactions, ultimately becoming a standalone division within a Fortune 500 company and leading that division as president and CEO. We had unbelievable success. And so often I was so stressed out, <laughs> focused on the next quarter's numbers, focused on the fire of the day. Um, I didn't allow myself the opportunity to zoom out mm. and, um, and, and really enjoy, mm. um, you know, Dan Sullivan's concept of the gap in the game. Yeah. Oh um, my gosh, it's so powerful. Often as CEOs, we spend our entire life in the gap. Yeah, sure. Um, and I think that's just how we're kind of wired. Yeah. And so my last parting message to the listeners is to live in the game. Yeah. If you haven't so, read The Gap in the Game by Dan Sullivan so and good. Ben Hardy, go buy it on buy Audible it. or download it or do whatever, you, however you consume books. For sure. Do it today. Yeah, that's a good um, one. That book changed my life yeah. for the better. But uh, enjoy the ride. Yeah. Enjoy the journey. Mm. And so give yourself a little grace. Yeah. Uh, none of us are perfect. Right. Um, we sit here and talk about these things. <laughs> the reason we can talk about these things with any ounce of credibility is because we've screwed up a million <laughs> We've made things. all the mistakes, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, so don't any of the listeners think yeah. that these guys, right, yeah. uh, got here any other way. And yeah. so just recognize that. Enjoy the journey. Mm. Enjoy the relationships with your team. Yeah. Um, and just uh, the last quote I'll leave you with is uh, um, to really set a high goal, one that you think is completely out of touch and unattainable. And then when you set, when you reach that goal, go set a higher one. Because yeah. we can accomplish so much more over time than we give ourselves credit for. Shoot for the moon. Keep going. Yeah. Build a great team around you. And um, that's the key to success. I love that. Yeah, it's a, it's a journey. And I love the fact that you said that it is a journey because I, I think that's too, too often, not just CEOs, I think every, le every high achieving leader thinks that when they get to a certain point, that, that's it. You know, hey, we, we hit that point. But you know what? Something I learned probably too late, not too late, but later than I should have, is that when you get to the top of a mountain, you got a great vantage point to see the next mountain to climb. And, and there's another one in the distance that you want to go climb. And so that journey, it, enjoying the journey, I think, is a really important um, component of, of really being a, a high-performing leader mm -hmm. and, and creating a high-performing culture as well. Tim, thank you so much for being here. I, I really appreciate you. Uh, appreciate your, your insights. I appreciate your perspective as a, a CEO, as a former CEO, and as a uh, a, a leader, a high-performing leader. I really appreciate your insights on culture and on growth. Well, thank you, David. It's always so much fun talking to you because you're uh, kind of the same cloth, right? We, we just look at what leadership's all about in a very similar lens and, yeah. and how to drive culture. And it's always fun to work with you, to talk to you. And I'm looking forward to collaborating with you and uh, really making a big impact for our listeners. Love it. Well, thank you, uh, listeners, for tuning in once again to In the Growth Space. Really appreciate you being here. Uh, make sure that if you're not a subscriber, make sure that you hit subscribe. And then also uh, give us a, a, a review. Give us a, you know, a five-star review uh, rating. And, and then also uh, give us a little bit of a review. What did you like? What did you take away? Um, I'd love to be able to hear from you as well. So um, David at davidmcglennon.com. Send me a note. What was your biggest takeaway from our conversation here today with Tim about a high-performing culture, culture cures. And so I'd love to hear from you. 
Um, be sure to tune in again next time. If you're a subscriber, it'll automatically down, download on your podcast. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again soon. And until that time, be well.